we ask the question, where do we go from here? And, you know, it's a, it's a pertinent question because, you, you know, we live in a world where everybody's upset, everybody's mad, everybody's um, grouchy, and, and we feel like we haven't made enough progress. And, and when you look at that, you're like, well, we haven't. And, and um, we have this audacious claim that in the Bible we, would, we see that God's plan is to unite all. I mean, this is his plan. And, and you know, it's kind of like, when are you going to do that, Lord? When's that going to happen? And a lot of people think, oh, it's going to happen at the end of the end of time. And that's when, boom, you know, the, you know, the angel will blow the, the, blow the trumpet, and then Jesus is going to come back, and then we'll have unity. But that isn't what Jesus said. It's not what the Apostle Paul says to us as carried by the Holy Spirit. And so, how does this work in, in your life and in mine? Where do we go from here? Because think about it. Do you see a lot of unity in your life? I mean, you, you could think about the world. You could think about your family. You could think about your school or your place of work. Or even if you're going out on the lake this afternoon, is there a lot of unity? There's more, more unity on the lake than any other place that I've seen. But, but, you know, people get along pretty good on the lake. You know, they got their boat. They got their, you know, beverages. It's working good. And, and so whatever it might be, there's, there, there's these different places in our life where we see maybe more unity, but we still see a whole lot of disunity. Now, why do you think that is? This is my question. Why, why, why are we not seeing a lot of unity? Because I've noticed, I, I don't know, see, if, see what you think about this, this thought experiment. I have found that if people would just take my point of view, we would have unity. Have you ever felt that? If they would just have my opinion, then we would have suddenly have unity. I, I, this is a, like, how hard this could this be? And, and then you start to realize that every single human being has that opinion. <laughs> And what we do as broken human beings is we go around trying to figure out, well, how can I convince you to hold my opinion? It, it, has, it is not lost on me as the one who is speaking at this moment that that's part of what's going on, is that I would sure love you to agree with me. But actually, guys, you need to know, I actually do not want you to agree with me. I want you to agree with him. I want you to agree with his words not mine. Because I'm going to be more, you know, I'm going to convince you that, you know, the Super Bowl champion Kansas City Chiefs are a really good football team or something like that. And some of you will agree wholeheartedly and others will be like, nah, nah, nah. and, and um, you know, we could go into things like that. But how do we have unity? Like real unity? Because that is the situation that is, is in front of all of us. You need to know that, that when Johnny and others and I were talking about what we're going to do this summer. We, were we, we came up with this scripture before the racial unrest and everything broke loose. The Lord wanted us to have this conversation. So let's dive in and take a look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. We're going to put these on the screen. We're going to zoom in on some words that the Lord has for you and for me. And I want you to, I want you to see these words in verse 3. The Apostle Paul is carried by the Holy Spirit. These are God's words. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who might bless us. That isn't what it says. What does it say? He has blessed us in Christ with, you know, some of those blessings. Uh, you, know, maybe, you know, I'll give you guys some. Yeah, maybe. No, 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 no. How many blessings? Every one of them. All of them. Every spiritual blessing. Now, you notice there's no period there, and this is problematic because I think Paul was a pretty good preacher. That's my personal opinion. But this whole opening chapter is like one sentence. I mean, there's no, there's no breaks. It's like every once in a while, people are like, you, do I need to hand you a towel? You need to just take a break. And Paul never took a break. He was just going. But every spiritual blessing, where? In the heavenly places. Now, see, right off the bat, we have to do a little learning. We got to roll up our sleeves just, just for a minute, and we got to work there because the heavenly places, what in the world? are the heavenly places. Because you and I have kind of grown up in a culture, in a world, where we sort of have heaven is up there and earth is down here. And up there is where, like, I don't know, um, you know, they play harps or something. I, I've heard. I don't know. I've seen some shows. Everything's white. Um, and, and they play harps for some reason. It just keeps coming up in all the shows, right? And then down here is like, I don't know what's going on. You know, down here, we just whatever. You know, the heavenly places 
there's this Greek word here, and, and, and you don't need to know the Greek, but it, I, I, you know, at some point, I, you have to share my pain, right? This is epiranias, epiranias. It's this word that, that the Apostle Paul uses all throughout his letter to the Ephesians. And he ain't talking about a white place with harps. Because in some of the places that he talks about this, he's talking about demons. He's talking about princes and powers and principalities in the heavenly places. Sometimes he's talking about how you and I are now seated with Christ, chapter 2, now seated with Christ in the heavenly places. And so what we need to do is we need to open up our minds to what he's talking about what the Lord Almighty is bringing to you and to me through his servants. And what he's talking about is this crazy idea that you and I are in the heavenly places right now. And I know, you're like, Mark, I don't see any harps. We can get a harp. I don't know, Joel, I don't know if you have Trent. Yeah, maybe not. But, but Joel's like, hey, we're doing guitars, and Aaron's going to play the drums, and Kathy's going to play keys, and we'll, we'll do some other things. But heaven is where God is. Amen? Heaven is where God is. Is he not here right now? Do you see what we're doing here? Is he not in your body right now? Do you see how in the heavenly places, in the epuranias, that is like not necessarily a place, like with a zip code or a, but it's a place um, one of my professors from seminary, Dave, you remember Dr. Gibbs, he would always say, wherever the king is, that's where the kingdom is. Isn't that interesting? Wherever the king is, that's where the kingdom is. And, and this is what we're talking about here. Wherever Jesus is at, <laughs> that's heaven. Wherever Jesus is at, that's heaven. Wherever Jesus is at, and now I'm pointing to your hearts, that's Epuranias. That's the heavenly places. And see, the problem that we have is not that we not that we can't have unity. It's that you and I assume we begin our day, and sometimes it feels like it's appropriate to do so, but we begin our day with the assumption that there cannot be unity because we do not believe that we're in the heavenly places. Now, I know. Some of you might be sitting there kind of furrowing your brow, just like I did when I was in seminary, and Dr. Gibbs would talk about this. And, and you, you furrow your brow a little bit, and you're like, but I ain't in heaven yet, right? And, and because at the, you get my left knee still hurts, right? This, <laughs> this is this where we start to think, and of course. And so what, what Scripture is doing is pulling us along a little bit, growing us, stretching us to allow for this idea that when we're with Jesus— whether that be in this building, which is a pretty snazzy little building, or whether you're out in the woods or you're on the boat this afternoon or wherever it might be. Wherever the king is, that's where the kingdom is. And this is the epuranias. This is the, the heavenly places. It's kind of like if any of you have ever seen Stranger Things, the upside down. Well, what if the upside down was actually like not just where the bad guys were, Right? but also where the good guys were, which it is sometimes if you watch the show. Take a look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, because look at this. The Apostle Paul is not content to just throw out one major huge thing. Now he's going to throw out another major huge thing. Even as, he says, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. And Folks here at Praise and Worship, we recently talked about the word agape, and it's this idea of undeserved loving kindness. It's not just love like I love pizza or I love the Chiefs. This is something much bigger. This is love that is undeserved, love that is free-flowing and just comes like a waterfall on top of your head and on top of mine. And what we're talking about here is when did this happen? Before the earth was made. Before the foundation of the world, of the cosmos. Now, that's just like, you're like, now, wait a minute. You know, a lot of people love to provide a date when they were saved. They're like, I was saved on, in my case, you know, 1972 or whatever it might have been. And, and they'll love to provide a date. Well, you know, this is the date that the Bible says you were saved. Before the foundation of the world. You're like, Mark, that doesn't make any sense. And I'm like, welcome to God. 
Because God goes beyond our understanding. He, he transcends our understanding, right? And that's pretty cool because otherwise we probably would have found that we made him up. But instead, we serve a God who walked out of a tomb after having been put to death at the hands of evil men. And he walked out of the tomb to prove to us that what he says is true. What he says to you right now is that you were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. Now, a lot of people will be like, um, how does this work? Because isn't that like predestination? And does, do I need to like break out theology books? Well, let's take a look at the next verse, verse 5. He says, he predestined us. There it is, just in case you didn't want to talk about it. The Bible brings it up again. He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. Now, just really go. We're going to do predestination in 10 seconds. So are you ready? You're like, buckle your seatbelt because we're going to do predestination in 10 seconds. Some people say you are either all people are chosen and all people are damned by God. Other people say it's your choice. And here we have the Bible talking. What do we do? Of course, this is where, um, you know, the people don't like me because we, they think that those are the two extremes. And everyone always knows that this business of, of the people at praise and worship, we always look at what Scripture says. Scripture just got done saying you and I were chosen before the foundations of the earth, and yet I can produce 10, 15 passages where people reject their faith. So it's like, which is it? And the answer is God chooses, God saves us, but for some reason, inexplicably, some people reject him. Can we choose him on our own? Nope. You know, it's like my Uncle Marty said, I, there's no way my own reason or strength can I do this. It's instead the Holy Spirit who works, and he did it before the foundation of the world. Likewise, sadly, some people say no thanks to God, and so that's why we got to keep working. That's why we got to keep sharing this time that we share together and keep pouring out the, the promises of God. Because look at this. This is the promise of God. See, Paul's not interested, or at least in this particular letter, he's not really focused on this. Like, for example, what he's, what he's wanting us to see is the good news here, not the thing that breaks our brain or our categories. He's like, look at this. He predestined us for what? Adoption. Now, I put another Greek word up there. Again, everybody's like, gee whiz, I thought this was like Father's Day. Can we get a break, Mark? Not today. He, it's huothasia. Huothasia, which is just like, what is that? And what it is, is that's the word for adoption. And it's a legal term. It's a legal term in the first century. That's why our English Bibles add that phrase, as sons. And a lot of people are like, oh, there's the Bible. It's being misogynistic again. No, it's not. It's the exact opposite of misogynistic stuff because what it's doing is it's saying there is no difference between male and female in God's kingdom in terms of our rights, in terms of our, our identity in Christ. It's saying you were all adopted, even if you're a female, which in their culture was not, you can't have that. You can't have an inheritance if you were a female. You couldn't do that. And here the Bible is saying, well, in God's kingdom, you can. And in fact, you are. So it's not trying to say everybody's a son. It's trying to say everybody is equal in the kingdom of God in terms of his mercy, grace, and family identity. Those who had grown up as Jews in this time, you know, the only way the women could be brought in, they couldn't be circumcised for obvious reasons, so they were brought in through marriage. And, you know, and enough of, I know, I'm sure as my wife can tell you, we, we have to deal with enough as it is with these men, right? That's what it is. So what's going on here is to see the good news of Jesus to say, all of us have been adopted into his family. Now, some people are like, well, which ones? How do we know all of us here? It's really simple, guys. If you hear the words and they tickle your eardrums and the, and the vibration happens and the brain somehow figures out the signal, and then somehow at some point the heart gets involved and you hear it and you like hear it, hear it. And then the Holy Spirit comes along and says, please believe this. It's for you. Please believe this. It's for you. It's God Almighty coming to you through a bunch of yahoos and a yapper so that you would believe and know that it's true. You don't have to get into some sort of formulas. Well, if I do this kind of thing and I have this much water in the baptism, I do all these things, I gotta get all my doctrines right. No, it's God's word. It's his promise, and he says it to you right now. You're adopted. Not just into any family, but into God's family as his child. 
Take a look at verse 7. Because Paul's not content to stop there. The Holy Spirit keeps pushing him. And he says, present tense, in him we now have. In Jesus we now have. What do we have? Redemption. Because you might be sitting there going, Mark, you can sit there and say that I'm adopted. You can sit there and pretend to think that you know where I've been. But I, you don't know nothing about where I've been. You don't know the dark places I was at even yesterday or the day before or 100 years ago or whenever it was. And I'm like, I don't have to. Jesus redeemed you. He died for you. There is no person so bad that God can't save them. And there's no person so good that they don't need God's love. I'm quoting Rich Mullins there. But the point is still the same. And that is, is that in, in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood. And guys, there it is. There are those words. The forgiveness of our trespasses. And it's interesting that he chose trespasses. Because a lot of times here at Praise and Worship, we highlight as the Bible does, that there's sins that we do, that we do them. Have you ever done them? I've done some sins. Stick with me this afternoon. You might see me do some, right? I always try to keep it not so bad in the, in the worship service, but, you know, everything sometimes that happens. And so then, you know, you, you, you have these sins that you do. You also have the sins that you don't do. Have you ever not done something that you should? We currently are in a con, con, continuing thing like right now. Like, like here at Praise and Worship, we're not in a community that, this is, this is what I've heard, we're not in a community that really has racial troubles. Well, really? I wonder what our brothers and sisters who are in those minorities would say to that as they go to a convenience store and get tailed around the, the convenience store and, and the white people don't. Or as they get pulled over by the police or whatever and the white people don't. And all the examples can go. And everybody's like, uh-oh, Mark's gonna talk about race again in a sermon. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. And the Bible's getting ready to talk a whole lot about race. So just buckle up. The point is we all have forgiveness. We all do. Because do you want to know how unity happens when we all, remember what we said? I would have unity with a whole lot of people if they would just agree with me. The good news is Jesus forgives me and you. And you know what that puts us on? A very even playing field. So if I have sins that I've done by not doing something, such as defending my brothers and sisters, such as not calling it out when, when there's just ridiculous behavior by people, whatever it might be, then, then, then I have forgiveness, and so do you. And it's not because of I'm suddenly doing it right now, because guess what? I'm not going to do it right every day, and neither are you. He is this is the good news. And look what he does. It's according to the riches of your good behavior. Nope. According to the riches of what are those two green words? His grace. His grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. Or as I love to say, it's all the things that you don't deserve that he pours out on your head. All the things that I don't deserve that he pours out upon my head. Why? Because of his agape, his love, undeserved love. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 8. Here it is. How much of it? I love it. He lavishes it. Have you ever lavished something? Just so we're all clear, I love to make homemade ice cream. This is one of our the summer activities, if you were to stop by the Hunsaker household. And you know, when you're, it just gets, oh my goodness, my, my tongue is now watering. My mouth is watering. And you're just cranking that because we don't do these electronic things. That's like, no, that's like some sort of abomination. You crank it, right? And, and whatever it is, is you, it, you, it just, you, you put the good stuff on it. You can start lavishing it with all the good toppings and everything like that or you just go total straight vanilla, like old school, and it's still good. Whatever it is, do you see what I'm trying to do here? I'm trying to give you a mental image that is very distracting to me, and it is saying that he lavished. He lavished his grace upon you and upon me with all wisdom and insight. Look, have you ever thought about that God was smart, that he was wise to love you? Have you ever thought about that, how wise God is to love you? And you might be like, well, Mark, I haven't always done things right. Yeah, but he was wise to love you. He, was, he had insight to love you and to love me. And he lavished it. It's, like, it's not like, eh, I'm, gonna, I'm not like an eyedropper of love. You know, you know. No, it's just, it's just like I can, I can imagine, you know, with all the whipped cream or something. You know, just if you had an unending, no, I'm sorry, this is really bad. But you get where we're going. Ephesians 1, verse 9. 
Why was he doing it? To make known the mystery, make known to you and me, to us, the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. A lot of people have asked me, how do, I, how, how do we handle our broken world right now? Because it's extra broken, it would seem. Everybody's wanting to burn places down. They're demanding justice. They're demanding retribution. They're doing all these things. How do we, how do we respond? And the answer is we look at the cross. Because that's where God puts his plan on display. It's like if you go to the science fair, or you know, you go to the state fair even, you got all the blue ribbon stuff, right? You know, and all the winners and, and the, the things that are on display. You know, and then you come around the corner and there's this dead man hanging on a cross. And then next to it is a rock that's been rolled away from a cave. I mean, that, that, that's the blue ribbon display. Because that's where God says, you know what? I don't want you guys to suffer the wrath, so I'm going to suffer the wrath myself. I don't want you guys to have no hope, so I'm going to actually defeat death itself so that you know that my plan all along was to restore all things, to restore all things. And I'm going to put it on display in my son. His name is Jesus. And if you don't want to know what it looks like, then the people who are nailing him to the cross, are putting the nails through his hands and through his feet, they're stabbing the spear in his side. They've already put the crown of thorns on there. They've mocked him and they've divided lots about his clothes. And what does he say to them? Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. This is on display. And it's a mystery because you're like, I wouldn't have done it that way. Praise be to God. He did. What is the goal of all of this? Verse 10. Now, you guys got to watch out. You'll see at the bottom there, it says MLV. That's Mark's literal version. That means I translated the whole passage. I didn't just give you one Greek word. We did the whole thing. Because two things, this is one sentence that's been going on for like a whole page in the book of Ephesians. So I had to bring in the noun of the sentence, which is the father. And so we had to put that in there so we can see it. But then the second thing is, is this business of always, right? It's, it's, it's the father's plan was always to unite all in Christ. The things in heaven and the things on earth. People will say to me, but Mark, if we're focused on, on unity, what's gonna ha- aren't we going to lose our country? See, it looks to me like the Father's plan wasn't to make the United States the best country in the world, although maybe he did along the way in order to achieve this plan. That I don't know. That's up for debate. The point is, is that his plan is to unite all in Christ. So we don't have to fear. We don't have to worry about a certain political group gaining power. We don't have to worry about another political group losing power, whichever it might be and whichever day of the week it is and who's throwing what kind of mud. Instead, what we want to do is we look at one another and go, wow, those are individual people that God loves and he died for. And his goal is he wants all of them to be united. How many of them? All. Even, even, and it's not just all. Look at this. It's unite all in Christ, which things, all the things, which I love that. It's a very interesting. It's a, the word for things is in there. So it's not just the people, but it's the things. It's, it's, it's your pets, your house, your, your ground, your all things, all of it. He wants to fix the molecules, and he wants to unite them in the Messiah, the one who came to save us all. You remember where we started? It would be so easy to unite everyone if you would just listen to me. Or in your case, you could put yourself there. Say, if you guys would just agree with me, we could be united. What if instead we went God's way and we said, actually, this is all about Jesus. This is all about following Jesus, trusting Jesus, receiving the promises of Jesus, basking in the love that he has lavished on us, restoring us from our own failures so that when we look at our brother and sister, we don't see, oh, there's another person who doesn't see it my way. But we look at another person and we recognize that since God wants to unite all things, all things, and guess what's unique about all things? They're all different. All the things are different, just like the people. And that we could start to see the fact that you don't agree with me. Now get this, guys, get this. The fact that you don't agree with me could be actually a cool thing. Could be a beautiful thing. Not could be, is. 
a beautiful thing. And that while, yes, God doesn't want us fighting each other and burning places down and, and killing people and all of these things. He doesn't want any of those things, obviously. But for, for God's people, what do we do? We go with him. And he will give us the power to look at one another and say, you know, you might be different than me. You might have different thoughts and opinions than me. But we're brothers. We're sisters. We're family. Because of what God has planned from before the foundation of the world. He ain't done yet with that plan, and he has invited you and I to participate. Please pray with me as we do just that. Father, we ask you boldly to help us go with you in this plan, to help us believe that unity is possible, to help us begin our days not assuming disunity, but looking for opportunities for very different people to have it. Not because we agree on everything, but because of you and what you have done. And I pray that you would guide us in looking at people through your eyes, not ours. That we would see people in love, not in hate. That we would see people as humans, not inhumans or less than human, just because they do something because you saved us when we did all the wrong things, and you promised to save them in the same way. Help us actually ultimately receive this powerful truth. There is no them. There is only us. We ask this prayer boldly, Jesus, because you said those who ask will receive, that those who seek, that they will find. Those who knock, to them the door will be opened. And so we ask you to help us see that there is only us. We pray this not because we're religious people. We pray this not because we are smart people or whatever other kind of people. We pray this because, God, you are our Father, and you have adopted us into your family through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. For more information and for more audio and video content, visit www.branson.church.